Okay, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Okay, let's pray and we will start our class today. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for this time to learn. And uh, we ask, Lord, for the strength, the empowering of your Holy Spirit to help each of us, to open our hearts, our minds, um, to learn, to be equipped, and to be able to serve people well, and to serve you well. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we are going to uh, pick up uh, a new lesson. So in some way it's a little change from um, uh, what we have been doing so far. Uh, we go to lesson number nine. Uh, we will talk about um, the Bible, its authenticity and accuracy. So now we want to uh, uh, learn some things about how the Bible came to us and about why the Bible is reliable. I say, okay, you Christians, you read the Bible, you say everything Bible, Bible, Bible. Why this, how do you know Bible is accurate? Like, how do you know that uh, you can rely on this? Because it was written so many thousands of years ago. Uh, you don't know who wrote it. You didn't meet those people. How can you depend on these scriptures, right? So we need to understand uh, a little bit about how the Bible came to us. Uh, how was it all put together? Why these 66 books? Why not others? You know, there are a lot of other things written during those days. Why those writings did not come into the scriptures? Why this is special? Uh, so we want to understand some of those uh, basic things. Uh, we also want to know why are there so many different versions, uh, especially of the English Bible. I don't know how many. <laughs> there are probably a few hundreds. I don't know how many versions. English Bible itself. Then you think of other languages, so many. Uh, how can you say all of this is correct? And sometimes, even if you put two English Bibles side by side, meaning is slightly different. So even we get confused. Why are there so many versions? And why it is, they're not saying the same thing? You know? So we also get confused sometimes. So people can ask us these kinds of questions. And so we just want to be able to you know, respond properly, explain why. Um, and I think uh, one of the, the most important things that we can share is that how the Bible has affected our own lives. You know, how the Bible, what, has the, what has the Bible done in your life? And just two days back, I was uh, one young man. He wanted to meet me, so I went and met him. And uh, as part of his testimony, like uh, God had, he had a powerful encounter with Jesus. Uh, uh, he, he's just maybe in his early twenties. I mean, must be I don't know, twenty-two, twenty-three, like that, some something in that age. But he was sharing uh, from very young age, like from fifteen onwards, he was on alcohol, drugs, everything. You know, it really just uh, doing all that. Uh, his, of course, his parents were very troubled, very disturbed by that. Uh, many times he went to rehab, came back, uh, all those things. Very difficult uh, thing, you know. Thing. So then he, sh he was sharing on September 3rd. That's uh, how many days? Nine days ago. He had gone, he had got his whatever things, drugs he was doing. He took and he was actually very high. Uh, middle of the night. But he said, this is what he said. Uh, middle of the night, uh, in the midnight, he was awake, and he suddenly just felt something leave him, go out of him. In his own words, he said, the demons that were in me left me. And he said, from that moment, no more desire for alcohol, no more desire for drugs, no withdrawal symptoms. So he says, I, I, he's been doing drugs for so long, 
next morning he's expecting withdrawal symptom like you know all these uh, bad uh, terrible feelings he's, he's expecting nothing gone no no withdrawal symptoms um, no desire for anything just just change but one very important thing he said he said he used to love to read and he's, he's you know read lots of novels books and all that dude but he said in the past when he sat with the bible nothing made sense it was like as though somebody had put one dark glasses he can't see. didn't make sense but he said after that night so now he says and there's only in a few days now so, so now when i sit with the bible everything is making sense it's like my eyes are opened yeah. so it's, it's so beautiful it's so wonderful reading the bible now yeah. so he himself was sharing that total change that took place of course his parents were praying you know through all of this what he was going through uh, especially his mother she never gave up like she was a uh, just continue then beautiful thing happened got it and god did it sovereignly because he was by himself the midnight suddenly just deliverance happened it was just a supernatural work of god completely delivered no more he said i feel like my mind has changed my everything has changed in my life he also went to the doctor did a full checkup because he said i was expecting my body to be in a very bad shape because of so much a half a liter of alcohol every day i was expecting my body to be in a very bad shape but they checked my uh, liver my lungs uh, lungs everything everything is perfect even he was shocked he said yeah, but this is god's mercy right how he did it but i think the the one one thing he mentioned was before i tried reading the bible it didn't make sense it couldn't come i i he would read many other books but bible it is like i can't see i can't understand but now the bible is making so much sense it's like my eyes have been opened like my like somebody's taken off the dark glasses i can see right so god's word uh so when we share about our how god's word has affected us right how you know some people say oh bible is such a old book oh, written more than 2000 years ago people wrote it so old book why you why you reading why you saying you're building your life on the bible but when you share your personal testimony how the bible has changed your life so look this bible has power you know this is truth yeah uh, it has changed my life right? so that will uh, draw people in so you read and you see the bible has changed my life so you read you see and now just a little background you know the bible it's the most respected book but also most hated book some people in history have tried to destroy the bible we don't want the bible anymore let's destroy it you know as early as uh, uh, 8300 the roman emperor one of the roman emperors there he wanted to remove christianity from the face of the earth tried you know couldn't happen today it's all over the world uh what's notable is that there was this uh french philosopher walter he predicted in 100 years people will forget the bible they will remember my teachings to the almost 400 years later nobody knows him <laughs> the bible is known everywhere the reverse actually happened but he had the you know he was trying to say bible is outdated we need some modern philosophy for the people nobody not not too many people uh, hardly know his philosophy but the bible is translated it's spread all over the world It's reached so many millions, millions, billions of people, right? And uh, in fact, the the story story goes that his his own house was used to print Bibles. 
you know. So when people have, you know, thought that the Bible will disappear, it will get outdated, it will become irrelevant, it will be no longer meaningful, they're only seeing God's Word, the Bible, becoming more and more powerful. Of course, there are people who might misuse it. <laughs> Politicians quote from it just to, <laughs> you know, gain popular. Whatever. People, there are people who are misusing it. But if you look at it, lives are being changed constantly. So what happened? I read the Bible. Why you changed? I read the Bible. What happened? Uh, you know, just just reading the scriptures, lives are being changed. We keep on hearing those testimonies. So that means there is something, something very special, something different. It's not an ordinary book. So we need to understand, okay, how did this Bible come to us? How can I trust on the scriptures, etc. That is the natural side, which we want to learn. Now, uh, just to set the context, what we already know uh, is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible claims all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that means this is God breathed. God is, God is behind these words, so it's not ordinary words, right? And uh, it's given for us to, you know, work shape and shape our lives, to teach us, to correct us, to instruct us, to equip us. And um, Second Peter one twenty and twenty one, that this did not come through any private interpretation no no nobody sat somewhere in one log cabin somewhere in the jungle and said okay i will sit down and I'll write a book <laughs> it didn't happen like that this is not uh, you know somebody's own imagination but men of god people wrote it yes but they were moved by the holy spirit so there is the human side yeah we agree people wrote it so it was they used the language of their day uh they used you know whatever they the style the literary style they used that yeah there's people who wrote it but these people were moved by the holy spirit so that is why we are saying it is god breathed so god's hand is in it while man was doing the work man was working sitting and writing of course but through them god was writing so um what we also want to look at is we want to look at the, the, the human side. You know, how did this come together for us today? So that today we can sit with the 66 books and say, this is God's word. We, we acknowledge the spiritual side. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit was working. But let us look at the human side of the Bible, right? So the Bible, uh, written over a period of 1,000 years, Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew, some parts, that's primarily in the book of Daniel, were written in Aramaic. The reason was, at that time, the Jews were in exile in Babylon. And uh, Bab uh, Aramaic was the language being used there. So Daniel, some chapters were written in Aramaic. But the rest of the Bible was written in Hebrew, the language of the Jews. And uh, 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 the New Testament, uh, was completely all written in Greek. That was the language that was being used in and around. It was part of the Roman Empire, so they used Greek, so it was written in Greek. So totally, when you go from Genesis to Revelation, we are actually covering a span of 1,500 years. So over 1,500 years, these different books were written. Now they are all compiled together for us. Right? How did it happen? Why these six books is what we want to understand. So, how did the Bible come to us? If you go to page uh, 42, in those early days, it had to be handwritten on leather scrolls or before that, papyrus, right? like paper, but not so fancy paper like we know today it was you know papyrus and it had to be handwritten so think about sitting and writing genesis <laughs> by hand you know it's not easy even today to copy from uh, 
We use it in right in hand uh, to write without making mistake. It's not easy. You can't take an eraser and erase it. You have to write with the hand without mistake. So it is a very, very, uh, very tedious work. Not easy. Right? And uh, there were special people trained to do this. So uh, the scribes, they were trained to copy very carefully. And those days, they had a practice. If you made a mistake, destroy the whole thing, start again. Because you want, they want to do it without any mistake. Like that. Very tedious. Very strict. So it was not an easy thing for, you know, to make a copy of the scriptures. But copies were made. People would sit down and write very carefully. Handwrite. Then later on, they started writing upon uh, leather, animal skin. So leather things so stayed a little longer. right? So you can see some pictures there on page 42. How very carefully they would write, copy, check. Right? So there are people dedicated for this kind of work. And copies were made. But when you say copies were made, it's not like, you know, okay, today print 4,000 copies. We do that with a printer. Printer, please print 4,000 copies. We'll print in two days and send it. It's not like that. Just to make one copy of one book of like Genesis, this takes a long time. But these are copied and then preserved. Now, uh, when we talk about ancient literature, that means work literature that was now on, on page 43, ancient literature, there are two things we look at. One is the number of manuscripts that we have. Then you can check, are they all saying the same thing? Number of manuscripts. That means. Copies were made, other copies all same. If the copies are same, that means the text is accurate, it's good. If copies are all different, then you won't know which one, which is right. So the number of manuscripts we look at. Second, we look at the time gap. Time gap means how close to the original happening and the original writing do we have manuscripts from? The closer we have, suppose the original writing or happening took place, say, example, uh, 1000 BC, 1000 years, 1000 BC. If we have manuscripts that come from, you know, 900 BC, that is close to 1000 BC, then we say, yeah, we are very close. That means the chances of error are less. Because it's a copy that was from close to the original. But if we have a copy that was like, okay, we only have a copy from, you know, 1 BC or 1 AD, that's 1,000 years later. That means we're saying we have a copy, it's 1,000 years after what was the original was written. We don't know how much has changed in between. No? So the, the smaller the time gap, the more authentic the manuscript is so two criteria how many ma how many manuscripts you have what is the time gap then we can say the text we are reading is very reliable it is close to the time close to the original and we have many manuscripts they all are saying the same thing that means the text is correct you understood no how, how we look at the manuscripts so when we compare, when we compare with some other ancient manuscripts, uh, writings, right? So you look at this, you look at Plato. So Plato was a philosopher about three, four hundred years before Jesus, you know, before the writing of the New Testament. Only about 250 manuscripts are there. And we have manuscripts only from 1300 A.D. That means about 1,600 years after him. So in between, copies were made. Those copies are all lost. We only have the copy that was made in 1300 AD. Right? Uh, yeah, maybe from 9th to 13th century. 
So there's a gap of 1,600 years from the time he lived and he wrote his things to the manuscript that we have. Big time gap. So maybe you're saying, hey, you don't have so many manuscripts, big time gap. But today people will quote, Plato said this, Plato said that. You don't know if he actually said it or somebody <laughs> wrote something. Because there's such a big time gap in the text of what we have. Things could have changed. So like that, you see some other historical manuscripts, some famous philosophers, you know, Aristotle. We're not sure how many manuscripts are there. Uh, and the time gap is quite big, uh, and so on. Uh, given, you know, we've given um, uh, examples. So even if you think about William Shakespeare, you know, we uh, many many uh, in English schools they will say you study William Shakespeare, read it, is the right thing. But actually, uh, many of his writings, we are not hundred percent sure because there are so many different versions of the place. Like there are hundred hundred passages that are in dispute, and it is also recent, like from the fifteen to sixteen hundreds. So even there, you know, uh, uh, some portions of his work uh, we're not so sure because there are so many different versions of it. But when you look at scripture, and here's the interesting thing: when you talk about the Old Testament, think about this. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. So I'm just giving one example, right? We look at one example, how, how things changed. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Malachi was written 400 years before Jesus, 400 BC, 400 years before Jesus. Up until uh, 1940s, 1947, Till 1947, the oldest copies of the Old Testament scriptures was from 900 AD. Right? 900 AD. That means there was a time gap of 1,300 years from the Old Testament book. Malachi was written 400 AD. We only had copies that were made in 9. Oh, sorry, Malachi 400 BC. We only had copies that were written in 900 AD. That means 900 plus 400, 1300 years later. That's a big time gap. But then something interesting happened. In 1947, there's one shepherd boy. Uh, if you go to the page 44, 45, uh, he was, uh, his sheep, his goats or sheep, whatever he's taking care of, they wandered, you know, near the Dead Sea. Uh, they wandered into some caves. So he followed, went in. It's called the Qumran Caves. And in those caves, there were jars, clay jars, lots of clay jars kept. So this was a discovery. So what did they find? They found the scrolls of the Old Testament. So th that's why it's called Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's near the Dead Sea. So these people had written, they had made copies of the Old Testament, put it you know, in these sealed jars, clay jars, and kept it in this place. So he found these the caves here and where the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, they had, they were copied before 70 AD so you can see a picture on page 46 you know, the scrolls and uh, these scrolls were from about Let's say the earliest one would be from 150 BC. So suddenly we jumped. So on page 47, you see this. We before that we had scrolls from 900 AD. 
Now they found scrolls from 150 BC. That means you are, now this time gap is only about 300 years or 250 years from the end of the Old Testament. So time gap has reduced. And again, what is so interesting is there was almost no difference from the scrolls they had in 900 AD to the scrolls they found from 150 BC. No change. In fact, they say the book of Isaiah was exact. That shows how very carefully they copied. But it also shows that the text did not change. Even though it was copied over 1,300 years, the text did not change. You understanding? No? That is how very carefully these scribes were copying the text of the scriptures. So this was a great validation of the authenticity of the Old Testament text. That means what we are reading is the original. Hardly any change. From 900 AD, you find another set of scrolls from 150 BC. They're all saying the same thing. No change. Nobody corrupted it in between. Right? So this immediately gave, a, you know, gave us such a big uh, boost in our confidence that, hey, the text you're reading is the original. The scribes were very careful when they made the um, uh, copies of the Old Testament. Now, um, the, uh, so now what has happened is, as they found manuscripts in different parts of the world, like, so like we said, they found copies in the Qumran caves. They found copies other places. They, uh, they, 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 they gave names, you know, they, okay, this is, and depending on where it is kept as well, I'm, I'm on the bottom of page 47. Okay, here's all the uh, manuscripts that were from uh, Alexandria in Egypt. So Egypt, Alexandria, Northern Egypt, was a very important place. It was a major city in those days. So obviously scrolls were taken there. People could afford to buy it. The scrolls were taken. So they found a large uh, collection of scrolls there. Um, there are some scrolls that are found in the foot of Mount Sinai, which is kept in the British Museum. Uh, some of them are kept in the Vatican Library. So they are given different names. Okay, This set of scrolls kept here, the set of scrolls kept here. So these are all the Old Testament scrolls. These are all preserved for, kept ca carefully, kept safe, right? Uh, and then we also have the Greek translation of the Old Testament. From the Hebrew, it was translated Greek. That is called the Septuagint, and it's kept uh, in these places. The New Testament is a little, uh, because it was written more, you know, uh, in the first 100 years of the early church, you have many more copies, uh, 5,500 Greek copies, then Latin, and uh, over 9,300 versions, uh, early versions in a few other languages. So totally about 25,000 manuscripts, 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Lots, because there were more you know, copying and writing, making copies. So if you look at uh, you look, look at that little table on page 48. Old Testament, we have 10,000, a collection of 10,000 manuscripts, not four or five, 10,000. And the time gap is only 150 years. It's come down to that. New Testament, more than 24,000 copies. And time gap is about 50 years from the time it was written, you know, copies were made. That means, in terms of ancient scripture, ancient text, the Bible is most reliable because we have the most number of manuscripts and time gap is very small. So if anybody says, how can you depend on the scriptures? Explain. We have more manuscripts than any other ancient scripture. 10,000 in the Old Testament, 24,000 for New Testament. And time gap is very small. That means we have copies starting from when it was first written, very close. 
within 50 years of when it was the original version, we have more co we have copies. The copies are all saying the same thing. Right? Some variations would be here and there. Fine. We know that even though people are trying to write carefully, human error is there. We understand. And those will be marked in the Bible. They will say, okay, this manuscript says like this, this can manuscript, right? We will explain that a little bit. But in terms of number of manuscripts, thousands, not hundreds or tens. You know, some historical literature, you only have three or four copies. Here we are saying 10,000, 24,000 copies. So you can compare, see how steady the text is. Right? So that is what I want us to understand. In terms of ancient literature, the Bible is the most reliable text. I'm talking from a human, si human side. No? You look at it from a human side. Very reliable. Okay. So, yeah, would, would there be copy errors? Yeah, because it was copied by hand. We acknowledge that. Uh, there could be errors, some slight differences. So those things we have to handle. We have to uh, compare. Right. So, so again, from here, we don't want to sound, uh, you know, we don't want to sound very proud or arrogant or something. If somebody says, you know, how you compare Bible, Quran, Vedas. So Vedas were orally transmitted initially. So probability of uh, things changing. Again, we're not, we're not, don't say this in a way that, hey, yeah, you're bad and we're good like that. But you just, you compare. So you compare. Uh, Quran was written in the 1600s, yeah, uh, or no, sorry, uh, in the 900 AD, somewhere around that time. But you look into the the content of what it is. You know, um, the the story of Prophet Muhammad and what he did and things said, and compare the, that with the Bible. It was written over one, a period of 1,500 years, 40 different authors, and they're all saying the same thing about God. So what is the probability, or how is it possible, 40 different people living over 1,500 years, right, separated by, over that period of time, in their experience and in their inspiration and writing, would say the same thing about God, as opposed to um, the Quran or the Veda. The content, you compare the content of what is there, you know, um, and you let people make that decision, right? So we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be arrogant, like we don't want to be, you know, you see, you say, see, you you compare yourself. You compare these things. You compare. If you're looking from a natural standpoint. Okay, I think somebody may have asked a question on the chat. Let me just see. Um, sorry. Uh, was there somebody asking a question? No. Also, uh, just a few huh? questions. Oh, question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, some some a little silly, but uh, just it was there. Yes, please go ahead. So Aramic and Arabic are totally two different languages. Yes, yes. Aramic and Arabic, and uh, with regard to the pages of Bible compared to any other book, who decides the pages, Pastor? Because the quality of pages, in the sense, like you know, dis, uh, irrelevant of whatever the version of the Bible is, the uh, material of the Bible and the thing is the pages. It's really different compared to any other book. So, so when you're saying like you mean the quality what uh, yes the thinness and thing it's really different compared to any other book no isn't it uh, uh, the printers are only deciding no but it's like it's, it's so different publishers. compared to any other book no possible is it? i mean the thing it was just the back of my mind oh okay okay and uh 
so you are asking about the quality of the yeah, the paper the, and all that yeah. so those are decided by the publishers, the publishers. Okay. i think obviously one of the reasons is that they use very thin paper thin. so that it doesn't become such a big book big book yeah okay. so it's like to give, it's easy to easier to carry okay and of course then you need different kinds of uh, font sizes font for sizes. different kinds of people mm -hmm. All those things people have to take into that the publishers sure, will sure, sure. Okay. decide. And what is the meaning of manuscript, Pastor? So manuscript, when you say manuscript, it is the origin. It is the original writing. It is the writing by uh, the original writer or the people who made copies of it. So right now we only for ancient texts we have copies as opposed to the very first one. Right? So let's say when Moses sat and wrote, we don't have the exact piece that he wrote, but we have copies of what he wrote, right? which were made later over time. Uh, and then copies were made for copies. So when you say manuscript, you're talking about, OK, suppose a scribe sits and writes, and that work is preserved, that's a manuscript. It was an original writing by a scribe who copied from an earlier version of what he had. Um, yeah, so that, that's what we call as a manuscript. It's inclusive of different languages that it has been translated? Yeah, so, we, so mainly we will go with the original language, which is Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. Then, of course, we can add other languages, meaning like the Hebrew was translated to Greek. Then it was initially also translated Latin. So, you know, we could take those. So the count of these manuscripts, I think, includes, uh, let me just check. Yeah, it includes the early languages, uh, uh, including Latin. And uh, so starting with Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, copy in Latin, including all of that, we have so many manuscripts. Uh, final one, Pastor. Is it okay to read Quran or is it better to refrain without debating from them because with any online source or thing, just for an understanding because so much of relevance is there on the Old Testament, Abraham, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Ishmael and the thing. So yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong if hmm. uh, you know if if somebody's interested hmm. and has the time to do it to read the Quran or you know any other text that you somebody wants to do it. I don't see anything wrong in it if somebody's interested. But it wouldn't influence us in a different way, no? Like, uh, I mean, it's not the word of God, but just trying to read, and then it has it should not have an adverse impact. It was. Yeah. Um. I I don't think we should wouldn't. fear. Like, so as long as we are strong in our own faith, in our own understanding of the Bible, from a knowledge perspective, right? Uh, and if somebody has the time and the interest to do it, uh. It's nothing wrong, nothing wrong, and uh, we shouldn't fear. But generally, we won't tell every Christian go read the Quran. And you go, <laughs> first of all, people don't have time to read the Bible itself. <laughs> then, on top of that, you're saying, go. <laughs> so it's a first you finish reading the Bible, you understand, you study the Bible. But I'm talking about somebody who has the interest, who has the extra time. If you want to know, understand, you know. Um, for the sake of understanding their perspective, yeah. If you have the time, and that's nothing wrong. To answer any queries, if at all we uh, come across things. What yeah. I'm told, I've heard this Ravi Zacharias, uh, you know, talk many times on this aspect, <laughs> especially when it comes to a Muslim, it's better to refrain from argument the best thing that you can do is just uh, present the gospel and just give genuine love. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's yeah. the best way forward. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So um, we will have uh, like one, um, two lessons coming up. One is to share Christ with a Hindu and a Muslim, where we just uh, we just give a an outline of what they believe. Uh, so it's good to understand what they believe. What does a Hindu believe? Uh, what is the Muslim beliefs, right? Uh, what is their faith? So that when we communicate, uh, we should communicate the gospel in a way that they will understand. Right. So that that is useful. So when uh, when we're talking about the gospel, and so we'll we'll, we'll learn that, and uh, we have two lessons on that. 
uh, how do we communicate the gospel to a Hindu? And how do we share Christ with a Muslim? If we understand a little bit about their mindset, right? so that when we speak, we are doing it correctly. Otherwise, they may misunderstand. Because when we say salvation, they are thinking something else. We are using the same words, salvation, but the meaning for them is different. So we have to be careful how we communicate. If we communicate clearly, then we can, you know, share the gospel and. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, in which time period people started to read New Testament? Um, so the New Testament. So within the first century, uh, the New Testament was written, and then they started making copies. Of course. In those early days, the letters were written to the churches. So they immediately read it to all the believers. You know, they started reading. So when Paul would write his epistles, for example, he wrote it to the Thessalonians. They would read it. They had only one copy. So imagine you go to church. You have only one copy. Because Paul has written, you have the original copy. He sent the letter. All the people are sitting, you know, and they read out. Okay, we are reading to you. Letter from Apostle Paul, Thessalonians. Read everybody, everybody listens. You know? So that's how they would learn. Right? And then slowly copies are made. So copies are from there, they will send it to other churches. So they also can have copies. But it is not like hundreds of copies. You know? Like slowly copies are being made. So other churches can also receive that same teaching, same understanding. So to answer your question, right from then the first century, people were having portions of the New Testament, like the letters that were written, which they were hearing, and copies were being made for more and more churches to share. So from that time itself, they were reading and hearing. But not every individual was having their own copy. That came later on after, you know, long after, because first they had to uh, invent the printing press. Then they started making copies of the Bible. Then I think, let's say, around 1600 or 1700, people could get a copy. You know, the public, general public can get a copy. But it took a long time from more than a thousand, thousand five hundred years later. Till that time, few copies you would hear, remember. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, why Bible in some areas and Quran is in some areas like uh, same like Moses, uh, Jesus and there you can read there also about Moses and all. Yeah. So we can, uh, the couple of reasons. One is because Islam, so Judaism, Christianity, the Christian faith, and then Islam, they all started among the people from the same region, like we say called the Middle East. Uh, so the Christian faith actually came out of Judaism, right? So there was we have the same history because we have the same Old Testament. We have we believe the same Old Testament. It was only in the New Testament because we believe in Jesus the Messiah. So that's when the New Testament revelation understanding came. And so we are building on it. So there is an overlap of Judaism to the Christian faith. Our, our history is the same. Right? Just that the Jews have not embraced Jesus as Messiah. So they stopped with Malachi. So Jews, if you look at Judaism, stops with Malachi. For us, we have seen the Messiah has come. We are continuing the journey. Later on, Islam came. Right? But it came in the same region. So they therefore borrowed a lot of the history <coughs> from the Jews. And traditionally, if you look at it, they were like the descendants of Ishmael. Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, 
Ishmael went, had his own descendants. So the Arabs, as we or we call the Muslims, the Arabs in the Middle East, trace their journey back all the way to Abraham. So all of that story and that history, they take. But it was all happened later on when Muhammad came. But the history is traced back all the way till Ishmael through and through Ishmael through Abraham. So that history they also have. Because it's in the same region, the same part of the world. Right? So that's how we have that, you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, that overlap of history is there. But for them, there's there are some, you know, I would say like some things are vari variations um, in, in the stories, some variations. Question? Just want to add for this and yes, uh, question. Ahead. So about uh, we can know that many names are similar. You know Moses, Musa in Quran also. Can we say that the scriptures from Quran, Quran also taken from the manuscripts of uh, Bible? Oh, whether they were uh, copied from? Or... Yeah. So how exactly? Uh, so one is yeah they would have read and heard the same stories coming from the original writings. Uh, but when it was written, what they exactly they were referencing, I don't know. But the stories were there. You know, They already knew the stories. And so whether they actually used the same manuscripts to write here, I'm not sure. I don't know. Because it was, it was written by, yeah. Like say done in secret, so I don't know what they. Yes, so the, the manuscripts were already there. Uh, the Old Testament manuscripts they were already there before uh, Quran was written. Because this Quran was written only around like uh, I think six hundred or AD or something. Old Testament was already there from four hundred BC, so they would already know because it's all the same region. All the stories would already know. Be known. I don't think they'll accept. I mean, uh, they recognize already that there is an overlap in history, but they may not, uh, you know, accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Abhishek, you want to say something? Go ahead. Go ahead, Abhishek. Wanna add on this, Pastor? Like, uh, I have read the Quran before. So what? Uh, so in the starting of the Quran, they have mentioned like uh, Angel Gabriel he came on earth, and whatever he has said from his mouth, uh, the Muhammad he has written with his hand. So like this, they have mentioned. Mm hmm. Okay, that's a good point. So, uh, so Abhishek is mentioning right. So. Prophet Muhammad claimed a direct revelation from God. So he begins with that claim that Gabriel gave it to him. Or he was caught up into heaven, whatever, and had that. So it would maybe be very difficult to argue that he actually he heard all these stories before and then wrote it and claimed it. You know, it's very difficult to argue because his claim is Angel Gabriel came and told me these things. But remember, it happened. Like around 600 AD, uh, which is long after the Old Testament was already there. But having that claim is very, they would not accept that actually the story is already there before Angel came and revealed this. They would say it is the same, using the same name. Uh, but whether that actually happened, or we don't know. Discuss or we try to debate. Will the simplest claim not be like you know the way history itself is divided between AC and, uh, BC and uh, AD? Will that itself not suffice all the other? Uh... Yeah. So I think that's a that's a powerful testament that all of history, human history, is centered around the person of Jesus. 
But of course, they can say that is because you set up the calendar like that. The Gregor, you set it up like that. I mean, people set it up like that. So that's why it's like that. So, but to think about, like, you know, when you just take a step back and say all of history centered around Christ, I mean, that is a big thing. It's not a small thing, right? But people can always, uh, you know, refute that. So, okay, let's pause here. We'll continue this next week. We will get into a little bit more depth on how the Bible came to us. And, okay, let's pause here. Thank you. Take your break and.